<laughs> and a good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on the Tuesday edition of the show. It's the first one for the week. We promise to make you watch a while. I'm Yemi Adebayo. On the show tonight, we'll all, we're talking about football across the world uh, as we speak. Uh, matches currently going on in the EFL Cup. And of course, we'll talk about uh, the bidding process for uh, the 2025-2027 African Cup of Nations that will uh, get us talking. We'll also talk about the ladies, the Super Falcons of Nigeria. Uh, they're in the news. We'll talk about them. Uh, it's a two-man show. My colleague, Austin Okonakman, is suited and ready. And we're taking this trip together. What a great things to you, Yemi. A special shout out to everyone joining us on the show tonight. Action packed world of sports. So much is happening right from the grassroots to the elite level. So much is happening in our world of sports, and I'm pumped up to talk about it tonight. Uh, community football development seems to be getting some good attention in Nigeria. And I like the fact that ex internationals are supporting that initiative. Yemi, remember. Just, I think months ago, we are talking about the Niger Super 8. We liked the fact that it didn't just bring only players in the league. It also brought players that were not playing in the league. Now, this community development initiative what we will talk about tonight is giving non-league players an opportunity to play football. I love it. You mentioned uh, the bid for the AFCON. There's so much going on with African football development. So now, when countries are bidding that they want to host competition, CAF would take a backseat and say, show us what you've got. And that's why every time we come on this show, we keep emphasizing the need for infrastructure development. Why is not Africa leading with sports? It's because they're getting infrastructure right. So we'll continue to monitor that um, bid announcement from CAF, but my soul, spirit, body, and mind tells me it's going to Morocco, if it doesn't go to Morocco, it's going to Egypt. It is what it is because of what they have done for infrastructure. You mentioned the Super Falcons. We'll talk about them. Uh, surprise, surprise, Cameroon will not be advancing to the next qualifying round for the AFCON. I mean, that tells you that African women's football is indeed competitive now. Yes, indeed, it is competitive. All right, let's quickly introduce our partner in the Lagos studio as we dive straight into all uh, we're going to be talking about. And, of course, Shegun Vincent joins us uh, this lovely uh, Tuesday evening. Shegun, greetings to you. Thanks for finding our time uh, to be with us on the show. Yeah, good evening, Yemi. It's good to be back on the show. Uh, happy new month. I know it's the end of the month, but you know, we have not seen it in a while, but it's good to be back here. And I'm proud to come into the studio. You and someone were having an argument whether someone was bullying you or not. Nah, <laughs> nah. Just, just for laughs. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on on the show now. And I'm talking about uh, what else you talk about uh, grassroots uh, football uh, development uh, a lot has been happening uh, behind the scene there's been so much talked about uh, community based football tournaments uh, I mean that's the best way to grow football that's the best way to give um, locals a sense of belonging and uh, making things work uh, in the right uh, direction. Uh, also, let me pass the ball to you. I'll sit back and, and also uh, chip in when necessary. Uh, this is something that gladdens our hearts when, uh, because it's a drive uh, that we make uh, grassroots development spread like wildfire. I agree with you, Yemi, yeah. because we always talk about it, that at this level, it's 360 degrees branding. For channels, television, we led an initiative from the primary schools. Now, after the primary schools, they will advance to secondary schools. And then when they're now, you know, fully matured, they belong to the community. So when we don't have community uh, development going on, then that's poor. Now, former Super Eagles players, such as Augustine Eguavon, Dan Debula Mokachi, and Waida Koni, they are leading this community football development initiative. And I like the fact that corporate organizations are beginning to see sense in supporting football at the grassroots because that's indeed the way to go. That's the home of development. Forty non-league football clubs and community-based football clubs in Lagos will compete at this grassroots football tournament. The 40 clubs that will participate, you see, it gets better, I me and Shegun, they said. The 40 clubs that will compete will be mentored by these ex-internationals. In fact, I hear 40 ex-internationals. 
40 non-league clubs will be mentored by 40 ex-internationals. The tournament has been divided into five regions in Lagos with eight clubs in each region making it 40 clubs. You know, there's no way you talk about some competition. Everybody will be quick to say, what is in it, what is in it? They've got one million and Naira up for grabs, but it's not really about the money. It's the fact that we'll get to talk about football at that level. Ex-internationals have an opportunity to give back to society, mentor young talent, and at the end of the day, it will be for the good of football development in Nigeria. Why that can former Super Eagles player has been commenting about this initiative that indeed gladdens my heart. Well, again, it's a community engagement football championship. Non-league players, we expect. Players that have not played in any league, players that don't have, you know, playing in any or any MPFL, we want them to form teams and become a community. We can also call it an all-star non-league community teams because you know what you're doing? You're bringing all your best players in one local government together to play in this championship. And as such, we will be having, you know, bonding among the players, bonding among the communities. And, you know, we threw it out at one expert and they took it. So, I mean, they believed in it and that's why we're here today. Well, to be honest with you, again, you know, if I take you back to what I announced earlier, we're also going to be donating balls and bibs to all those local local governments that we we'll go to. And we've gone to the head, Lagos State FA, to say we're giving you 500 of balls, 500 of bibs for them to, because I know Lagos FA, as it's considered right now, they bring a lot, of, they bring people together. And, uh, and that's why we're also supporting that project. Well, so two things make it special. One, most times when you play in tournaments, you don't go with a trophy. Somebody's going on with this giant trophy. And of course, also, we're also engaging coaches and ex-players to, to mentor these teams, not the local government teams. So that's, those are the special points of this championship. Well, I, I think there is a long way for community players to come and play for national team. I believe with time, we will see players that will come up from these communities to play for Nigeria. And having said that, national team is not doing badly, except that we need the handlers to also try new players here and there, so that by the time they go to a, a Nations Cup in uh, Ivory Coast, we will have a better team to represent Nigeria, which I believe they will do well. Oh, I'm super good player, why are you talking about the importance of the community-based, the community football development initiative that ex-internationals are supporting? Shagun Vincent, I listened to him say, yes, it, it, it might be difficult to say, oh, we'll get players that will play in the Super Eagles from this sort of community-based tournament. But then again, the late Stephen Keshi walked his way into the national team from St. Fimbras College. And at this level... I think the players we say impossible is nothing and they can dare to dream. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you look at um, such competitions, like we had Christmas Cup in the past, and um, I think the channels are a big, uh, a big, a big um, media sponsor of uh, the events those years. I don't know whether it's been done until now. You look at these competitions, it's a, it's a medium for inclusivity at local level because not everybody will get to play at the MPFL clubs or play abroad. These are competitions that even if they don't get to um, you, know, you don't get to play at um, such level or play in universities or polytechnics. They get to play these things at the community level one. Secondly, you have to reduce crime because I remember in a popular club, I think it's MFM or so, I remember when Dr. Lukaya, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Lukaya was trying to start the club and then they were looking at to get youths that were off the streets and they were looking for youths that had talent and all of that and they better the football club, the male football club and they also better the basketball club that the, the MFM had. And, and I can go on and on about such um such um academic initiatives. initiatives that helped um, get good off the streets. If you look abroad, look at um, countries like America, you Canada, um, Australia. These are initiatives that they help um, people that people that are, you know help them go to school and then get these initiatives from there. They go to clubs. Uh, they go, go for a very young year, 13, 14, 15. And uh, having local community uh, com community um, competitions like this, although money shouldn't be the Factor here yeah, because I know, because you know, with money comes with problems. I said for as young age because they are not they are not mature enough to able to handle such an amount of money. It can cause a lot of fight and all of that. But for them, it's inclusivity, growth, um, uh, social planning for them to go into other things, play in the club, play in the competitions, play at the under levels, and probably miss why goods that probably go abroad. You know. For better pay, like other, I can go on about players that left Nigeria the shows at a very young age. We have the likes of um, Taiwan Oni that left at a young age, which was similar, I think it was 17 or so. Martin was a Sule boy that left when he was 16 or I can't remember, not, somewhere in his teenage age. These competitions, I think it was more popular, you know, popular in, in Sule then playing all those what they call futsal or what they call um, uh, maybe uh, monkey post, you know. Yeah. So I think this um, competitions, this competition will help replace the uh, in, uh, inorganized um 
constituents at the local level and help them to be placed at the proper level to prevent crime and all of that. You can go to, from, from, in every ghetto, in every street, they have like a few where they play and they gamble and they bet and all of that. This competition will help replace such, such this initiative, I mean, will help replace such, um, yeah, um, I, I it will make it more modernized yeah. rather than them having turned to fight or court wars or whatever, whatever, because you don't score, you do, and they, they have to, if we use those places to form, to start to take drugs and all of that. But these competitions will, be, will create a formality, more like a rinse and wash of those people into a better platform. And from there, they shoot out their career, shoot out their platforms. And if, who, who knows? Probably we can have scouts. And we have initiative from Rebertis. A couple of clubs are in, Niger, Niger, in, in Nigeria now that can help promote these guys and take them to proper clubs, like what happens in South Africa and other, on, 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 on other nations. As yeah, may be. I, you know, with, with, with things like this springing, springing up here and there, I think we're on our way. One of the things Shegun said that I agree with um, is that it's a springboard. And what a springboard does for you is like a launching pad. It gives you an opportunity to probably get to places where you wouldn't get to. I mean, you take basketball, for example, in the United States. Um, I mean, you can't walk too many distance before you see a basketball. Every community has. And that is what is fast disappearing in Nigeria. I mean, schools don't even have football fields these days. But it wasn't like that before. And that's why I agree with Shegun that this uh, community-based uh, initiative can help, but I'll still back up and say government needs to be deliberate about these things. You know, not everybody's going to end up play for the Super Eagles. Not everybody's going to help. Uh, it's not going to become a, a professional footballer. But if you do those things, one, you take the youths off uh, the streets and also they're able to hone their skills. I mean, use their creative energy for positive things, not just, I mean, a brawl or going to all of those things. And I mean, the, the list is endless. What can be done uh, with this? So, uh, I mean, I, I implore well-meaning Nigerians to, I mean, follow suit, do all these kind of initiatives and government can help uh, with uh, the structure. I also talked about ex-internationals uh, throwing their heart uh, into uh, the ring, supporting this. I also talked about uh, 40 of them took to mentor uh, each of these teams that would uh, be playing. So let's listen to uh, Dan Debole, Amokuchi, former Super Eagles captain, Austin Zerezo, Ergo Yvonne as well, uh, also former Super Eagles captain. We'll listen to both of them. Uh, we'll come back for more on Sports Tonight. Football uh, unites us. Whether we like them or we don't, football unites us. If you remember in 96, football, God used football for democracy, for the rebel nation to stand for in South Africa. And God made sure say we don't go because if we go, it's no use of So that's why they're winning. But if it's in Nigeria, go problem for winning and God for not using that one. So, but the truth of the matter is, I'm from the north. Uh, I know how diversity is out there. Growing up as a child, uh, we lived as well back in the, those in the 60s, those in the 70s, those in the 80s and the early 90s. We know how United Nigeria was. And this initiative, using football to bring our community together, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much because this is a huge issue. Because we need to be one again. Nigeria is only scattered. And if we can use sport, and we can use grassroots, we can use the community to stand firm, then Nigeria will be great again. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Wayne, for, uh, for sitting up and making sure that uh, we see today. And uh, for the press, you have a lot, a lot, a lot to do. Growing up as a young man, we had opportunity to play football, but we never had sponsorship. Now I see my dear coach here, Fanny Amu, Ambassador, down the pool, Wadi Akoni. I'll tell the story about me and Wadi, how I took over from the international team. I see Friday, Bo, Friday Lao. My MON, Henry Wusu, Big Bae, all my teammates, we never had an opportunity like this. So, if we have an opportunity like this to give back, and we don't, we'll be doing a great disservice to the game that brought us to that life. 
We are not politicians. Whoever, whoever that is committed in developing football, because Nigeria football is dear to every Nigerian's heart, will always be there to support, regardless. That's it. Um, wise words from uh, Daniel Amokuchi and, and, of course, um, Austin Egwevoin. So, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to back this up with more initiatives and also uh, the young ones will benefit and have a chance to probably uh, become like some of these guys they've um, idolized uh, over time. All right, let's move on to uh, the big one, talking about the bids for uh, the 2025-2027 African Cup of Nations. Nigeria is in the mix. Uh, of course, uh, by tomorrow, we will know what will happen. Uh, but first, let's, um, uh, let, let me bring back Austin in, in, into all of this. Um, yeah. Expectations, I can't really say expectations are high, to be honest. Yeah. I, I can't really say yeah. that expectations are high. Uh, it's, not, it's not a bad thing that we've thrown our heart uh, in, into the ring. Uh, but I don't know if I can say that the level of enthusiasm for uh, Nigeria as a host of a AFCON, I, I, I really don't see the enthusiasm. I may be wrong there. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And, 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 and I understand your cynicism, Yemi. You know, uh, it's clear for everyone to see we're still struggling with infrastructure development. Yes, we have stadiums, but how good are those stadiums? Are they world class? Are they TV friendly? And put it together, the AFCON, is it just about the stadiums? You get what I'm saying? Because people always get it wrong that you think when you've got a lovely playing pitch that you are fine, you can organize competitions. No, it's a lot. It's about planning. It's about logistics. It's about players' welfare. It's about organization. It's long-term planning. You just don't get up and say because you're Nigeria and you're blessed with population that you can do it. No, go and ask countries that are doing it how they're doing it. Look at how deliberate. I like what you said the other time where you were trying to learn from the Community Football Development Initiative talk. You said the government must be deliberate. There must be a monitoring process. And in project management, there's what they call stage gates, where you pause and you review, you ask questions. Did I do it right? And then before you move forward, that's what we're not doing. So. The only good thing we've done with this BDM is that we stepped down our dreams. They were thinking of 2025. And I'm saying, how do you want to do it in 2025? So it's a bit realistic for them to be going uh, for 2027, Nigeria, Benin Republic. That again, I'm saying, it's a dual bid. If we are done and put our house in, in order, why can't we host the AFCON? Cameroon did it. Who's the Af the Afcon? Remember Cameroon at some point with the negative publicity because of COVID and all the they had to dig deep and it gave us they gave us a world class competition. But we know our situation in Nigeria, so we won't fool ourselves or try to sugarcoat it or use flowery language. We need to do more for infrastructure development. When you go to the stadiums, you see it, it's clear for all to see. You cannot even go use. The toilets, it's, it's a complete mess. The stadium environment, what it is about, what sort of activities take there, takes place there. When I go to the Emirates Stadium, sometimes I even like the hospitality that I receive before the main event. You need to give people football experience before the main action. There's so much around football, not just go and watch people kick the ball around. Those are the things we need to learn. I was saying it that for us to do these things is long-term planning. You know, the presidency must be involved. People are admiring what Rwanda seems to be doing. Paul Kagame is not playing. He is sitting on top of that stuff, particularly everything that they're doing in terms of strategic partnership. So we wait for that bid to be announced. I think Morocco will get it for 2025. Algeria stepped down from the 2027 bid. So Scott might just say, let's see how it's like to go back to West Africa, give it to Nigeria and Benin Republic. But 2027 is just four years from now. In fact, three years from now, how much can we do to put together a world-class tournament to make the AFCON look good? I don't know. Let's go on a quick break. I'm sure Shegun Vincent is itchy to talk about this. And you also come back. We'll talk more about this 2025 and 2027 AFCON bids and then talk about the power of sports 
to transform lives. Don't go anywhere. Uh, welcome back. All right, so let's just uh, do some analysis. Austin had uh, broken it down. It, it appears like 2025 may be a slam dunk. Uh, so, but let's talk about 2027, especially because it involves Nigeria. So let's just uh, take a look at um, the contenders for the 2027 African Cup of Nations, the, the beat, those who have thrown their hearts into the ring. Uh, and let's not forget that a decision will be made tomorrow in Cairo, Egypt. Now, here's what we have, the contenders, Nigeria and Republic of Benin. Uh, have, of course, joint bid. We have Senegal, Egypt, Botswana. Then, of course, you also have Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Three countries uh, putting in a bid to host the 2027 uh, Africa Cup of Nations. Now, Nigeria put a joint bid uh, with Benin Republic. But let's take a look at the facilities. Austin also talked about that as well. Where are the facilities? Uh, let's see uh, the facilities, the proposed venues. Uh, that will be used just in case Nigeria gets the nod. You have the MKO Abiola Stadium in Abuja, Adokia Mesimaka Stadium in Port Harcourt, the Slim Balogo Stadium in Lagos, Amadou Belo Stadium in Kaduna, Stephen Keshi Stadium in Asaba, Samuel Ogwemudia Stadium in Benin City, and the Sonia Abasha Stadium in Kano. Now, because we are in with Bene Republic, let's also uh, look at what they have to offer. Uh, and of course, two uh, stadiums. You have Stad Matthew Kerikou in Cotonou, and you have Stad Charles de Gaulle Stadium in Port Novo. So uh, for uh, Benin Republic, they're putting up two, uh, you know, stadiums for uh, the competition if uh, they get the chance to host. Now, a lot of people probably be asking, has Nigeria done this before? Yes, Nigeria has done uh, this before, uh, twice in recent uh, memory, uh, the 1980 Nations Cup hosted uh, by Nigeria. And uh, of course, it's going to come up on your screen. 1980 hosted by Nigeria in the year 2000, turn, turn of the century. Nigeria, uh, of course, paired with Ghana uh, for what you call uh, the Nigeria-Ghana 2000, the Nations Cup. Uh, of course, the one we lost right here in Lagos, uh, a lot of us, uh, the memory still haunts us. Uh, we lost to Cameroon via uh, penalties, all right? So uh, that's uh, the information. Uh, tomorrow, a decision will be made in Cairo uh, when there's a meeting. A strong uh, delegation from Nigeria is in Cairo, and we'll uh, talk about that uh, as we move on. Uh, Shaku, let me get your thoughts. Uh, I said, I don't know if I'm speaking, um, you know, for... Uh, the average football fan. So I don't think there's a lot of enthusiasm about Nigeria's beat to host. It's not a bad thing. It is good. But in terms of enthusiasm, I mean... Yeah, in terms of enthusiasm, probably maybe the locals will be excited that at least it gives us a form of joy. You no know, football is an entertainment. Everybody watches football. You know, I think um, it started came out like over a billion people on the planet watch football, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, Nigerians, we all love football, male, female, boys and girls, children. So, but, but as people that are been in the industry, of course, we're in the industry, now understand the nitty gritty of things, how things go by. How it should be done. Um, but I, I don't think we're not even ready to host a training session of an AFCON, let alone an AFCON. And not, this is not, not in the form of disrespect, but as a form of the fact that um, certain things are not in place. First of all, things like, you know, equipped facilities. The airports are they well equipped enough to handle handle? It also means that they will have to shut down a certain site for the airport because to prevent, uh, we know how fans can be security Road system network, uh, network security system you networks know. security or every all that all all that we training facilities. Even on our own side, you know they had an issue in one of the popular hotels. Remember, I think it was you know early last year, early last year when they had to, I think we had to get involved. And with the, that popular hotel, we don't want to mention the hotel on, on, on TV, that with the Nigerian team. So we've had these issues here and there, facilities, facilities, security, and are the, are the people at the helm of affairs, are they willing to help? You know, and of course, administrative level, and like I always say, everything rests upon leadership. And you don't want to bring a guest to your house and the next thing they're seeing in your house is the, is the, is the litter bin. 
No, you want to show them the fine side of your house, or you show them your TV. And this is where it seems like the other part is the one that is shooting this part. And we, 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 what are the plans? We can't want to just suddenly just host Africa. What are the plans in place? Are we planning to play to? Remember what happened? I think it was, it was last year when we wanted to do the. Um, the Nuga, and then they were working on doing some facilities in the Testing Delta, and then there were rumors of one of the facilities being, um, being, being rushed down or something like that, like having a friction or something like that, and then they were doing some PR to just cover up this issue. Remember, I, I, West Africa too, South Africa are not so far from us. They also have their own issues when they, when they, when they hosted the World Cup, like the facilities are not being used, the staff that helped build the stadia stay were not being paid. So there are always issues when it comes to Hosting tournaments is it good? Is it good? Of course, there will be some more investment, some facilities, and a lot of things that they bought. Are we ready to create an, an enable environment? Is it our hand we open one hand and they receive? Are we are we ready enough That's to open question. our hand yeah. to be able to receive these things that is a, that is a, like a, more like a, like a gold or like gold? Are we ready to receive it and doesn't fall? And when we receive it, hope it won't fall from our hand. All right. Um, I mean, let me go back to Austin. I mean, without repeating everything that you've already said, the big question is. Um, what will be the games? It's, look, it's not going to be difficult for Nigeria to win uh, a bid. To, to, I mean, we'll go through the bidding process. It's not good, but you, you said, and I agree, it's not just about telling us that you have stadiums. What about the other, what about the other issues? What about the amenities? What about the guarantees right. from government? What about our own issues with our economy? All of those things are key factors. Now, even if you win that bid, what are the gains? Do we do we host a tournament and nobody is telling us how much we gained, how much we spent, there how we much do. we made? Yeah, we do. Uh, how how yeah. about uh, the facilities? Are we still going to be using them after? Those are yeah. the key issues, not just winning the bid. I know you, you you've said it all. I mean, we, you and I, we <laughs> just being in the media, we knew the budget for the Commonwealth Games are made. Um, the city in Australia say, look, we don't have this kind of money because when their projection is that if we spend this kind of money, are we going to make double this money or even make back this sort of money? They, they did their, their risk analysis. They forecasted and said that it won't, it won't have any game. So they pulled out. You see how people think in advanced countries, somebody somewhere wants to score cheap political points, or when they take a look at what can we easily use for propaganda, sports comes to mind. And I totally agree with you. That's why we should ask these sincere questions. Is it just to host the AFCON in 2027? Then after that, if you, you could tell that, this, they, we put Benner in there just to get the favor, to get some vote from the Francophone, you understand? In real sense, we don't need Bennett to host the AFCON if we put ourselves together. So, yeah, um, we've got a minister. When we spoke to the new minister of sports, I, I think I mean, it said, he said some good things, and, and I'm glad he's with his team uh, to this bid ceremony. So there must be some points in it for Nigeria that we don't know. But with the things that we've seen on ground, and because we've been covering this bit for some time to sound as authorities, because of the things we know, we're saying that this is just, it's just going to stress the country some more. We'll just be putting money into what we don't need. Yes, we'll get the top footballers from Africa come to Nigeria. We'll get to, uh, fans will get an opportunity to go watch them. And after that, what is in it for our football? How is it going to, to develop the ecosystem in Nigeria? What's it going to do for our clubs? What's it going to do for football at the grassroots level? Because, yeah, I mean, we know what's going to be. I saw the list of the proposed stadium. I keep telling people, I have covered almost all the stadiums in Nigeria, telling reports, when it rains, all our problems are exposed on the pitch. The moment it rains, you saw it with Bendel Insurance in their last game, you know. So we need to sit back and, 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 and do long-term planning, you know. Just take a back seat and put your house in order so that when you have an opportunity to do something, you're just going to do it right. All right, I agree with you. Um, let, let, let's move on. Um, let me throw the ball at you again. Let's talk about the ladies, something that always uh, brings a smile to your face. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody joked and said, 
um, they, they are wondering what Saltome did to Nigeria that they are always uh, getting to come <laughs> against us. Uh, but they found a way, <laughs> they found a way <laughs> not to come against us. Uh, but yeah. then another team uh, is in <laughs> line to face Nigeria. And uh, a lot of people are saying they might receive a, high, a, a, a serious beat. But let's talk about uh, the women's um, game now and um, the team that will likely meet Nigeria. Yeah, uh, that's that's Cape Verde. You know, uh, they won 6 2 on aggregate, first leg 3 0, second leg 3 2 against Liberia. And um, with what we're seeing with women's football, yes, uh, no disrespect to Cape Verde, they can't come close to the Super Falcons. But I was saying this, and then Kenya is stopping Cameroon from advancing in the qualifiers. So women's football is developing in Africa, and Cape Verde can dream. You know, particularly if you want to be amongst the best, you must be the best. So when they, you know, find out now that they're coming against the Super Falcons of Nigeria, the toast of Africa women's football, they will start getting ready properly. And I, and I trust the Super Falcons not to be complacent. I, I think South Tome and Principe did the right thing, you know, by saying, no, what are you trying to do to us? Because you're just going to, you know, hurt that team for a long time if they had come to play the Super Falcon. So uh, they had to, you know, uh, abort that mission was good for them. Now it's, we know uh, the next opponent for the Super Falcon will be Cape Verde. And Cape Verde, you yeah, mean, go take a look. That's a country that they seem to be focused. They are not, you see, where, you see, where, you see where we're coming from with that, with that big talk. Look at how Cape Verde seems to be advancing with their basketball, with their football, even their men's team. Watch when they play. They are no pushover, but a small country, you know, but they are punching above their weight because they are planning and doing the right things, you know. So uh, shout out to Cape Verde. Um, let's congratulate them for, you know, making it uh, to the next level where they will meet Nigeria, but, but it seems it's the end of the road for them. All right. Um, Shagun, um, what do you have on your screen? Austin already talked about it. Uh, but but then again, it reminded us. Um, I mean, Cameroon ending their journey. Uh, I, I don't want to say it's because of complacency. Teams are really stepping up. And so, Nigeria's next opponent, based on what you have on your screen, is covered. Should we go to sleep? Should we uh, be worried? Uh, uh, we should be worried, but not worry in a, in a negative way. We should worry that at least um, we shouldn't them down, um, we shouldn't um, override them. And they are they beating Liberia, coming for the game playing against Nigeria. They can, if you know the uppers in African football, many of the smaller teams, or many of the teams that don't have, they are not as strong, they are causing a lot of upsets here and there. So I believe that um, we should look at it from a very, uh, some point of view. We are, we, um, the, the, the women team, they just lost, you know, in England. Of course, we did, we did well, in my own opinion. Because looking at what happened, and then we need to pick up a win to get the team back on track. Get the chemistry rising, of course, the confidence. The more you win, the more you get the confidence. So basically, that's it. And let's hope that it pans out to come out in a good way for the Nigerian women too. All right. Uh, all the best to uh, the Super Falcons when they get a chance uh, to play. All right. Let's talk about uh, something that we really talk about uh, here on the show, uh, the Invictus game. Uh, of course, the Invictus game started in 2014. Uh, it was, uh, of course, founded by uh, Prince Harry uh, and the Duke of Success uh, himself. Uh, he is a veteran and, and of course, um, he, 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 he was part of uh, uh, the initiators of the idea. Invictus means unconquered. So you have uh, a lot of people who've been in the army but injured, uh, somehow, but using sports to give them a sense of a belonging. Now we have a Nigerian uh, peacemaker, and Zegbola uh, is won gold uh, at uh, the games. They just uh, concluded in Victor's Games in Dusseldorf, Germany. And he's been talking, he's been sharing uh, his thoughts, how he feels good again, how he feels uh, proud to uh, be Africa's first gold medalist uh, at the Victor's Game, and how he feels honored. Uh, you know, with what has happened uh, and that, you know, it feels good that after he, he, he was injured, a lot of things came through his mind, but winning this has lifted the mood and uh, lifted his spirits. Let's listen to uh, Peacemaker and Zeg Willam and we'll come back for more on Sports Tonight. So it is a competition that 
21 countries is involved. So me becoming a champion, it means that, yes, truly, I'm, I'm great. So I feel excited. I feel celebrated. I feel loved by people. And also, I feel loved by my country. Without managing our injury, the disability we got during our service while defending our country, we are still unconquered because we are alive today. Hence, we are alive, we are not being conquered. That is what the word Invictus means. That I was injured on October 18th, 2020. While we are approaching to dislodge a location called Dambua, Wajiroku, I was fired by Boko Haram terrorists with AA. That is a gun called anti aircraft that is being used for air, uh, aircraft. So I was fired by Boko Haram, and that leads to the amputation of my left leg. So after I am being injured, I got, I, I, I got into a lot, a lot of things emotionally, physically, and, and also even mentally. I was like thinking a lot of things. I was not myself, so it, it was very tough to be sincere. It was very, very tough when I, after I got my injury. So I'm in sports now in Invitus Games. I'm in a new platform that is being organized. I have something doing. For example, I'm good in powerlifting. I do, I, I, I do sitting volleyball. I do tennis ball, short puts. So I don't have time to think. I don't have time to, to worry. I have new friends now. I have new families now that can encourage me, advise me, and know where to help me. So the sports have helped a lot in my recovery. All right, uh, Peacemaker, uh, Zwei Bula. Um, I mean, talking about Invictus game, they saw him uh, is a rehabilitation of wounded servicemen and women through sports, and that's what has happened with Peacemaker, and he has, he has won gold uh, in that event in Germany, and he feels very, very proud, and has been able to put uh, the, you know, th that incident behind him. Uh, there's more to live for now uh, that this has happened. Um, I mean, Shekou, let me get your thoughts uh, quickly. Uh, now we have a Nigerian becoming the first African to win. He's making us uh, talk about it. Personally, I feel the Invictus game is a good idea. Uh, you know, a, a lot of us don't focus on some of these things. It's, it's just like the Paralympics. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. just like, but, you know, everybody there, the wounded servicemen that, that are getting uh, rehabilitation. I could see the joy in the man's voice. I mean, it's priceless. Yeah, the joy in his voice was priceless. You know, you can see that if it's beyond the medal itself or whatever money, whatever. You know, when you, you've done, I, don't, I believe you've done a lot of stuff working with the men in force, both home and abroad, you find out that when they come up from war, especially the ones that are injured, they mm, have PTSD. Neglected. Some of them are neglected. Some of them, because of, I want to say the book about one of the seal team, he was, um, when he came back, I think he was injured or something like that, that he maybe lost his limb or something, and then he was hearing noisy, noise, probably maybe not physical noise. He had to be sleeping at the backyard of his house. He had to see at the backyard of his house. So these activities help them to, you know, strengthen their mind, you know, another mind, you know, you know, it's not growing, the thing we're showing. So, and they getting them involved in these competitions, make them happy, we care, and, and lighten their mood, you know, make them feel better, and of course, have more confidence in themselves. And him winning this thing is just amazing stuff. I hope that he does more. I hope that, of course, we can have something very similar that we can do in Nigeria and enable ex force men, both in the police, military, and all that, the nice and just, you know, because a lot of them go through tough times, and we, we, we see them on the road, even the ones that are physically, physically fit, we see them on the road and they act some, act some a bit way and all, and all of that. But creating a system like this can help them to just, you know, yeah. lighten up, you know, and I believe that uh, going forward, we can, we can yeah. work on that. Uh, especially when some of them feel that their sacrifices are not uh, yes. forgotten, and so uh, this is a good one. All right, let me. Um, of course, yield to Austin again. I will have a few minutes, maybe one or two. I'll talk about the EFL uh, Cup. Um, I mean, if you're a Manchester United fan, uh, at least today you will be smiling. Uh, <laughs> before we came in, there were two goals up uh, against Crystal Palace. Uh, Austin, I don't know if the situation has changed. Yeah, the situation has changed. I mean, it's now Manchester United 3, Crystal Palace 0. And so I would say, see, this is the one that you go and start, you know, showing yourself, you know, but this is very important because it will help the confidence of the players. And um, it's um, Anthony Marshall, yeah, with an assist from Casemiro. Uh, Anthony Marshall with the third goal for 
Manchester United, uh, Ganacho open scoring for the Red Devils. Casemiro got the second and provided the assist for the third for um, for Anthony Marshall to score. So good result for Manchester United and Eric Ten Hag. Uh, they're going through so much at the moment. So I always tell people a win is a win and you must celebrate your small win. And before somebody will be quick to say it's because it's the AFL, it's Crystal Palace. And Crystal Palace is a very difficult team to play, and they're an EPL team. So don't underrate this win, Manchester United fans. Maybe they might just use this to bounce back and get their season uh, right on track. Um, a game has been concluded. Bradford City losing 2-0 um, to um, Middlesbrough at home. And then, um, surprise, surprise, I was monitoring that game as we're talking. Exeter City has just taken the lead over Luton Town. So it might just be seen an upset. I know this... This competition, the FA Cup, the EFL, I call them the upset cup, where you see smaller teams come out here and show themselves. Yeah, you know I mean. All right. So um, as we prepare to wrap things up, we are hearing Messi, uh, Lionel Messi, is a huge doubt for uh, the U.S. Open. Now we have to follow what's going on in the Major League Soccer mm -hmm. uh, because of Lionel Messi, and the fans can't get enough of him. Uh, but it's, it's a huge doubt uh, for an important tournament for the team. Yeah, huge out uh, for the team, huge out for the players. I think I saw a video of Sir talking about the impact he had on the team. Huge out, impact on the business end because since he has come in, I can't get the figures here right now, the money they have made from sales of tickets, from sales of jersey, from posters, ETC, ETC, um, TV they rights. They just need him to be dead. They just need to be dead. It doesn't even matter if, he, even if, he, he, if, he, if he's even if he's all if he's sing is hallelujah, hallelujah. They will, he, they are even life. if he plays for five minutes, he, he just, just has to be. He just has to be there, and uh, it will be a disappointing one for them. And uh, hopefully, he gets back and returns and uh, helps them to continue. Uh, yeah, yeah, elderly, elderly football. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. That's the way she wants to put it. Uh, I'll say, I guess, uh, you, you have the last uh, bite of, of the cherry, uh, Lionel Messi. Uh, I mean, it's changed a lot for the MLS uh, since uh, joining um, uh, his club, uh, but then again, won't be available uh, for one of the crucial competitions. Uh, you know, and, and that's really, you know, hurtful, not just to Lionel Messi, but to um, the organizers and sponsors of the U.S. Open Cup. Uh, but I think they'll find a way to, you know, to turn it around because since Messi got there, the metrics changed, you know, the analytics changed. People are beginning to love what they call soccer in that part of the world. We call it football. Begin to love it again, you know, he's getting the, the numbers to the stadium. Not just spectators, top class, A-list personalities go out there just to watch Messi. So uh, I just hope that he comes back and then give that competition the glory it deserves. Um, that story by Peacemaker really got me, you know, got me emotional. I don't know wherever you are watching us and you're down. I want you tonight to feel the power of sports and it can transform lives. That's the show in London. I'm happen in everything you do remember let's keep talking sports bye for now all right uh it's a wrap before we go i want to thank shango visit for his time on the show today yeah, yeah, thank you very good back here and then it was, it's good to have your smiley face you know <laughs> <laughs> okay all right that's the show today thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day we'll be back here again tomorrow i'm yemi adibaya bye-bye now